Welcome to the last goodbye dash book, Heroes of America. I'm your host, Johnny Pizza Patangelo. I'd like to introduce you to my crew, our crew, I should say. I don't want to take the credit for everything. Our crew, all right? My executive producer, Nikki Patangelo Barati, and my co host, Ray Stingray Schnitzler, and our commentators, Jen Proetto and Ralph Narciso. And I'd like to say that uh, the song that you heard was. was uh, composed, written, and performed by my dear friend Roberta Roberts. We've got a special show tonight, a special guest on our, on our American Hero tonight is a Chief Warrant Officer, a Navy, uh, sorry, an Army pilot and dust off pilot in Vietnam uh, era. His name is Phil Marshall. And Phil, I'd like you to, to introduce yourself and tell us something about yourself and get into it. <laughs> All right. Um, well, best thing I've best place I can start is um, uh, warrant officers in Vietnam were, uh, for the most part, trained to fly helicopters. And uh, because the Army needed helicopter pilots, they dangled carrots out in front of high school graduates and uh, college dropouts, which I was. And uh, if you uh, could pass a four-hour test, if you could pass a flight physical, uh, then you were eligible to, to, uh, to become a helicopter pilot in the Army. So uh, because so many guys were fresh out of high school, um, you graduate high school at 18. A year later, you graduate basic training and flight school, and you're 19 years old flying helicopters in Vietnam. Uh, because I had a couple years of college, I was 21. But, you know, uh, we, we were kids just like uh, you guys on the ground. Did you go to the same basic training that we did? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. And what year? What year were you there? Uh, I was uh, basic training 68, so that put me in Vietnam 69. Uh, got there the 4th of July 69. Oh. Uh, November the 14th at night, about two clicks from the DMZ, uh, took one round through my door, hit me in the arm, severed the owner nerve. Uh, because they didn't do nerve repair in Vietnam, that sent me home. Uh, so, uh, but we got we got three guys out that we went in to get, so it was all good. Okay. 
Okay, great. Yeah, but no, I did not have to go back. That was when they started winding down the war. Oh, okay. Well, I got I got to tell everybody I owe my life to these guys. Okay. Well, yeah, so, yeah that, that's what we were there for. Uh, yeah. We, you know, it, as pilots, I I always say we were just bus drivers. The real heroes were the medics and the crew chiefs that kept you guys alive. Yeah, oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Our our job was to get the medic to the to the crash and and then let him do his thing. And yeah. again. They were 18, 19, 20 years old. Yeah. yeah. But, without, but without a talented pilot, the whole thing's going down. So if you were, well, yeah, you we, we got to be pretty good. Yeah, I'll, I'll grant you that. We got to be really good. You, you fly nine, 10 hours a day, and, and you're making 20, 30, 40 takeoffs and landings. Yeah, you get to be pretty good. Yeah, that that, that crap becomes a third arm. I tell you, you guys were great. Oh, yeah. Were great. But it, it got to the point where you just almost just think this, you know, you just think this is what I want the helicopter to do. And it does it. Does it. Right. right. Yeah. That's, yeah that's, it, was, it was pretty amazing. Yeah. It was pretty yeah, amazing. Yeah. 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 Wow. So, so, you also, did the, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, it's also like giving a kid a new Corvette. They gave me <laughs> right, a helicopter. There you go, Ralph. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. They okay. gave me a helicopter. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. So you, you, uh, did you do a full year tour? No, no, it was just um, four and a half months. Uh, I I was made aircraft commander, and, and four days later was when I was wounded. You know, you yeah. know something, Phil. You know, it's a funny thing. The things that you do in the service that you didn't, th you wouldn't know that you were going to do. Okay, we were in the boonies, right? We were we were we were beating the bush, and like a, we were recon, we were recon platoon. Okay, you know, you don't know too much about it yet. But anyway, about me, I should say. But um. We were we were in the bush and, and my my, my uh, sergeant this guy was a sergeant Santo Louis Louis Santo he comes up to me he says pizza he said come on we're going we're going we're going back to camp I said really okay fine it's good with me right he said but, but we're flying now I didn't fly I never flown on a helicopter before they never trained us to fly on helicopters you know what I mean yeah. said, here learn, we are getting on a, hard here, huh yeah here we are getting on a helicopter that we never did before the first time you know so. But it was it was a great experience. I loved it. <laughs> great, you know. Yeah, well, you can you can imagine how much we loved it being in, being at the controls of those things. But I tell you what, one time I have to say, there's one time that I got really mad at a, at a chopper pilot. Okay, and I think you can relate to this because you know, all right, we were flying, going to to an LZ. Okay, and we're full packing gear. Now there's four guys on the bench behind me, and I'm on the floor. I'm on the left side because I got the machine gun. Okay, and I'm sitting. I'm, my leg is hanging out. My gun is hanging out. Two guys in, yep. to my right. Okay, so now we're flying all, but we didn't go high. We were flying just above treetops. Right. And I'll tell you Make what. Small target. Not only that, this guy was making his turns like this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I'm telling the guy behind me, I said, I, it was Funky, his name, we call him Funky. I said, Funky, you better hold on to me because I'm going to fall out of this, this crap. You know what I mean? I said it differently. Yeah. And I was I was cursing that pilot. I said, man, because he, I thought I was going to fall out. Philly, I'm telling you, I thought I was going to fall out. But I, I, now, centrifugal force had your butt planted to the floor. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, really? trust me on that. But, it didn't but, feel like but that I will me. tell you this. I will tell you this: you, when you're sitting on the floor of the cargo deck, there, there's 200 there's 200 gallons of fuel underneath your butt. Really? Yeah, that's yeah. That, nice to know. Well, I'm glad I didn't know it then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're sitting so, on 200 gallons of fuel. Wow! Wow! So I I was yeah. just curious before you went to Vietnam, what and you you did you sign up? you know, for the military, or did they just call you and say, we need you? Or did you have intent, intention, knowing on what was going on back then, that you were, you were on your way to Vietnam? Sure, sure. Um, uh, when I went to college, uh, I was more interested in the parties and not interested enough where the library was. So I didn't fail any courses, but I had too many C's and D's, so I didn't have the grades to go back. And so at that time, if you weren't a full-time four-year student or if you weren't married with at least one child, then you were draft eligible. 
So knowing I would probably be drafted, which I was, but by that time I had already gone to, my goal was to go to each recruiter and whoever offered me the best deal, because I knew I needed the maturity. And uh, it just so happened, I went to the Army first, and uh, the recruiter says, well, what are you interested in? I said, well, you know, a lot of stuff. And uh, he says, well, artillery or, or, you know, he named off three or four things. And thinking as a crewman, because I don't have a college degree, I said, well, I kind of like to fly. Oh, well, we got this here, warrant officer flight training. Uh, we'll make you a helicopter pilot. And I said, I don't have a degree. And he says, oh, you don't need one. You got your high school diploma, don't you? you know, yep. So uh, I passed the, uh, the four-hour flight written test, and I passed my flight physical. And he says, you're eligible. And I said, okay, where do I sign and when can I leave? Uh, you know, we, we, we all knew we were going to Vietnam. Um, and once we got to flight school, we all knew that one out of 10 probably would not make it back. In fact, if you do the math, uh, one out of every 12 to 13 names on the wall in DC is either helicopter pilot or crewman. Wow. Uh, but you know, you kind of figure it's going to happen to the other guy. You don't want it to happen to the other guy. Hmm. Uh, but then we also knew that two more out of 10 would probably be wounded. Well, I was one of those two out of 10. But we were all volunteers, and, and that's the part I really want to stress. Any one of us could have quit flying at any time. Uh, and the only there's only one pilot that I know of that quit, uh, and he was involved in two incidents. Uh, the second one was his fault, and uh, three guys died. So he said, that's it, I'm done. Uh, you know. And they said, fine. They made him the uh, officer's club officer. But uh, the other 99% of us uh, volunteered. I mean, we had we had grunts like you guys that were volunteering to be a door gunner. How stupid is that? You know, a lot uh, of guys, a lot of guys, what do you call, volunteered that to to extend to get out early, but yeah. not really out. Yeah, and 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 how stupid of it was me to fly a medevac helicopter with no weapons. Yeah. Wow. I'll tell you. <laughs> what type? What type of adrenal did you have? Like. Like on your way there, like did you, did it just hit you, or or like you know when you flew that helicopter, you know did you get that adrenaline in you? Uh, are you saying adrenaline? Did I get an adrenaline high? Yeah, like you know, like you know, like okay, you signed up, you you passed. Now this is the reality. You're going to Vietnam. Now you you know what. Tell the audience, like, what were you thinking? What was sure. going on in your mind? Sure. Uh, about, I'm just going to throw a number out. It'll be close. About 20% of us that went to Warren Officer Flight School did not complete the program. Uh, it was very difficult. It's the hardest thing that I've ever had to do. Uh, not only learning to control the helicopter, there was a lot of regimentation. You know, they're making us an officer. So, so there was a lot of officer development and so on. Uh, but it, it was the hardest thing I ever had to do. Um, and uh, the training was by the best because uh, most of our instructors uh, were Vietnam veteran helicopter pilots. So, uh, but, but the other thing is, though, that they, were, they couldn't teach us a lot of the stuff that we were going to learn in Vietnam. So, so my, the best analysis I can give you is flight school, they taught us how to work the controls. Vietnam, we became aviators. We learned how to, to survive. We learned what the aircraft could do. Uh, and, and the saying is, in order to fly a, a helicopter to its limits, you first have to determine what those limits are. And so uh, aircraft commanders would teach the new guys, the co-pilots, and as we learned and became aircraft commanders ourselves, and we're teaching new guys. So, uh, uh, but it was uh, the becoming a, a Warren Officer helicopter pilot, like I say, was the hardest thing I've ever done. And you could not wait to get to, to Vietnam to show your stuff, to, to prove to yourself and everybody else you had what it took. Right, right, right. Yeah. But like I say, a lot of guys did not make it. I know. Yeah. No, I mean, a, a, a lot of guys that went to flight school didn't graduate. Oh, didn't? Oh, I see what you mean. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know our, our, flight school, I yeah, sure. our flight school was nine months long. We had, what, two and a half, three months of uh, basic training, and then we were went right to flight school. Um, the interesting thing for me was that after I got my bars and my wings, uh, 24 of us out of about uh, 150 uh, went to Fort Sam Houston in Texas. We got the 10-week combat medics course in five weeks as dust-off pilots. 
uh, we knew before we went to Vietnam we were going to be dust off pilots. And uh, I was devastated. I wanted, I wanted to fly guns. Are you kidding me? Uh, you know, I want to defend myself. But uh, flying dust off uh, was the most rewarding thing uh, that I've ever done. It, in fact, a good friend of mine uh, flew guns for a year, and uh, he signed up for a second tour if he could fly dust off. Really? So, 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 in other words, you, so you didn't have an AIT. You went straight to uh, flight school. That's, that's correct. Flight school was our AIT. Okay, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Phil, so, Phil, do you belong to this organization called the MOAA? Uh, no, I'm not, but I've had the privilege of speaking to the Military Officers Association of America uh, okay. to make some presentations. But I am a, a lifetime member of the Vietnam Helicopter Pilots Association and a lifetime member of American Huey 369. We have restored three Vietnam Hueys back to flight. Uh, we're based about an hour's drive north of Indianapolis near Kokomo, Indiana. So the, Can I read my I'm Hueys today? How cool is that? It's real cool. And I'm reading this article about uh, back in 2015, they started this. Um, uh, there was a Medal of Honor recipient, a Major General Pat Brady, and he said he he uh, was a fellow, had a fellow Vietnam dust, dust off pilot. The senator from Texas, John Cornyn, is trying to get the um, Congressional uh, Gold Medal awarded to dust off pilots from Vietnam. I'm wondering if you, you know anything about that or you know can enlighten us about that. I, I know it's been in the works for, for several years, uh, and I believe it's for the entire crew, not just the pilots, but I could be wrong. Yeah, but, I think you're uh, right. the, the crew certainly deserved it as much as, as us up front. The, the real sticking point is that our, our medics had the same training as, as your medics on the ground. And they were just as vulnerable, if not more vulnerable. You know, our guys couldn't hide behind a log. They're flying, they're hiding behind this tin uh, side of the helicopter. Um, but uh, some air medics that flew medevac uh, dust off uh, got the combat medics badge. But as a whole, uh, you had to be assigned to uh, an infantry unit to be eligible for the combat medics badge. But some guys were awarded it by, by infantry units. But the problem is that the Army changed the regulation to where air medics can wear the combat medics badge, but it's only retroactive back to 9-11. Uh, mm. It, 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 oh it, it, it um, intentionally leaves out the Vietnam guys. And they're the ones that, wow. that uh, you know, uh, pioneered the program. Yeah. So whatever the Army's intention is, and it's a real sticking point, and we have tried and tried and tried, and we cannot get the Army to rescind that 9-11 date and, mm -hmm. and go back to the Vietnam veterans. Wow. So, uh, yeah, we feel that's a real travesty. As pilots, we have tried and tried and just no luck. And there, somebody's got, uh, got the ass for, for Vietnam guys. I don't yeah. believe that's disgusting. That is. Yeah, it is, because our, our, our air medics were saving lives just like your ground medics. And like I say, they were probably a little more vulnerable, but that's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, your, your ground medics certainly deserved it, but we've, we've always felt that the air medics did too. Absolutely. I mean, we, uh, one, one story that, that I've become aware of, uh, the dust off helicopter was on short final to pick up a, a, a wounded. And, and as they're on short final, the, the radio operator says, dust off, break off your approach. Our, our, our uh, WIA is a KIA. Well, of course, our guys in the back, they're listening to the radios. They're monitoring all this. And the medic says, sir, get me in there. Well, of course, they were, they were going to go on in anyway. But they get the, the KIA on board, and the medic's able to bring him around. Hmm. Now, that ain't deserving of a, of a right. combat medic's badge. I don't know what is. That's wow. great. They didn't give up on it. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. They didn't give up. So, yeah. And, and let me throw one more statistic out at you. Uh, if you uh, were more, not mortally, if you were seriously wounded in World War II, you only had a 40% chance of surviving because it could be days before you got proper medical care. Mm. With that Huey and our onboard medic, if you were breathing when we got to you, you had a 98% chance of surviving the war That's because right. of that, that helicopter and that onboard medic. And, and the crew chiefs too, they learned a lot of OJT uh, first aid from the medics. 
Uh, we had a lot of crew chiefs that were in there with blood all over their hands. Yeah, yeah. everybody pitched in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I would have but, been one of those. I would have been one of those statistics. Statistics. I bled out on the field. I bled out. I did. My yeah. I had to do a cut down on me, and I because I was lost all my blood. You know, the veins all collapsed. Yeah. And of course, for the choppers, I was gone. Well, and and it's funny when we knew that you guys were serious. I mean, we're pushing that aircraft to the limits. I but did. the faster you go, uh, kind of the slower, slower. The more, um, the less stable the aircraft is i mean you know you're getting a little more vibration and stuff mm -hmm. and it wouldn't be unusual for the for the medic to come on the intercom sir could you back it down a little bit i'm trying to pop an iv here <laughs> so we hey. yeah so we back it down he said okay i'm good and now we're back up to 124 knots which is the maximum uh speed of the huey wow yeah, oh, yeah. That's amazing that's great mm -hmm. yeah that's, yeah that's, you yeah. know there's there's a bunch of stories out there yeah. 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 It was I tell you what, like I said before, if it wasn't for those choppers in Vietnam, then then that fifty eight thousand four hundred and seventy two people would, would have been tripled the amount yeah. of money. I think, more. I think yeah. John, you relate you related in your book The Last Goodbye about how when you were laying there and didn't you say that was the sound that got you you thought you were dead as soon as you heard the sound of the, the beating of the blades, right? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's like an angel coming down from heaven, I'll tell you right now. Right. That's, we, um, yeah. We call it the sound of hope. And and you're not the only guy that has said to me, uh, when I heard those blades, I knew my day was going to get a little bit better. Right. Now, yeah. now, Phil, the medevac helicopter has the big red cross, red cross on yeah. it, right? Yeah, a great aiming point. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, <laughs> but the Viet Cong, the, the North Vietnamese did not care. No, our understanding was that they had a $500 reward for shooting down any American helicopter, and they also got to wear a medal for it. Wow. Now, I don't know what they do with $500 in the jungle. Maybe they send it home to their family or something. But they were rewarded for shooting down any American helicopter. They did not sign the Geneva Convention, is my understanding. Right. So they they legally could could uh, fire on any helicopter whether whether it had a red cross or not. But uh, we did not carry offensive weapons. Uh, but first cav had door guns in their medevac helicopters, and they called it preventive medicine. Mm -hmm. And there were times I wish I had preventive medicine like that. I, I know I didn't know that. I didn't know that that you guys didn't have uh, weapons on your on your on your. We we had our personal weapons for patient protection. Right. Okay. Uh, I had a Smith and Wesson five shot uh, pistol that I had in a John Wayne holster, and whenever I'd sit in the seat, I'd turn it ninety degrees so the pistol's between my legs. <laughs> uh, and I had a an M sixteen slung over the back of my armored seat. Wow. Yeah. And now the crew. Well, a lot of times when you guys would would throw your wounded on board, you'd throw the weapons on too because you didn't want to be carrying around a bunch of extra weapons. Right. So, so our crew, they had M79 grenade launchers. They had Thompson machine guns. I mean, they had, they had all kinds of stuff. But again, because it was a handheld weapon, it was patient protection. Uh, it was not a door gun. And, and even the door guns were more or less just to keep the enemy's head down. Uh, a lot of times the, the gunners and the crew chiefs, they were, they were just shooting to try to keep the enemy's head down. They may or may not have had a, a target. Oh, yeah. So, most, of the time, most of the time there wasn't a target. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Phil, Phil, on on an average uh, flight on the helicopter, how many people is there to a crew, and what are their responsibilities on on the uh, on the helicopter? Sure. Uh, normally, a Huey had a crew of four. Uh, the exception uh, would have been uh, again first cav. They had the door gunner. The crew chief would have the other door gun, and and then their medic. But uh, we had two pilots, an aircraft commander who was experienced, a co-pilot who could be experienced or it could be his first day. Uh, and then you had the medic and you had a crew chief who was assigned to that aircraft and he was responsible for the daily maintenance. And uh, this is your helicopter. You're going to fly in it all the time. So you might want to take good care of it. Now, did, so, the, the, crew, did the crew chief uh, know how to fly it? Um, not really, no. Uh, a lot of the, uh, of course, you know what a loach is, an OH-6, the, the little flying egg. 
uh, a lot of the observers sat in the front seat because that was only one pilot in that aircraft. And so a lot of the Loach pilots taught their crew chief or observer how to make a running landing. Uh, learning to hover a helicopter is the hardest part. Uh, so they didn't really have time or make the effort because it, 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 it was very difficult to learn how to, to hover a helicopter. But it's easier if you can make a running landing. So, mm -hmm. so they would uh, you know, give some very, very basic uh, training on working the controls. Like I said, in flight school, you learn to work the controls so that uh, if the pilot was incapacitated, then, then the observer or the crew chief could at least fly the aircraft back to base and try to make a, a, a survivable landing. And, and, and Phil, how about you're talking about the crew being incapacitated? How about was your uh, Yui ever incapacitated, or did you ever have a problem where you're flying and all of a sudden the machine is not working? Uh, I had a hydraulics failure once uh, when I was a co-pilot, uh, and if you can imagine driving, uh, you know, the family Cadillac with no power steering, no power brakes. Uh, that's what flying a helicopter is with no hydraulics. It takes both of you to land the aircraft. Uh, it, it can be dumb, but it takes uh, a lot of strength, both in your feet and, and both hands to, to put it down. And uh, so, yeah, we did have a hydraulics failure, but we put it down safely because of our training. We had, again, we had the best training. And, and now you, when you, you flew from a camp that was dedicated to the medevac helicopters, it was. We, we were assigned to a hospital. Okay. Uh, we got a lot of our administrative support from uh, from the hospital. Okay. Uh, we we provided uh, a lot of room maintenance, but heavy maintenance, so to speak. Uh, I I flew. Uh, we were the northernmost uh, dust off unit. We flew out of Camp Evans and Quang Tri. Uh, so if we needed uh, heavy maintenance, then we had to fly to Da Nang, uh, Red Beach, uh, where um, uh, the unit, the civilian unit that was there, which by the way, was owned by Lady Bird Johnson. Uh, company provided the serious uh, heavy uh, repair work that we needed. But uh, most most of the, the maintenance we could do ourselves. Wow. Now, if, I, 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 that's 18, 19, and 21 year old kids. Right. If, you, if your tail prop got shot, can you still control that chopper? Yes, until you get below about 20 knots, 20 miles an hour, 25, that's when you start spinning. Okay. Yeah, the yeah the tail you the aircraft will slipstream at speed, but you don't land a helicopter at fifty knots or whatever. You you gotta you know you gotta slow it down to a hover to land it properly. So again, that's another thing we train for. Uh, we train for a stuck tail rotor, a missing tail rotor, uh, you know, no tail rotor control at all. But yeah, I I would much rather lose an engine than lose a tail rotor. Really. Okay. Uh, yeah, if you lose an engine, it's no big deal to put it down on the ground. But if you lose a tail rotor, you're probably going to crash. All right, so if you lose an engine, let's say the engine sh stops working. Uh huh? The, the propels keep turning and your chopper will just come down? It, it glides like an airplane. Okay. Um, you have a control in your left hand that we call the, co the collective pitch. And that, that's your up and down, so to speak. You're, when you pull up on that lever... Uh, you're increasing the lift in the rotor system, okay? So if you lose an engine, you put that collective pitch all the way down, and those uh, rotor blades will pinwheel. You, you can pinwheel down from 12,000 feet uh, as long as you've got oil pressure in your transmission, which, but, uh, but that, those rotors continue to pinwheel. And then as you get close to the ground, like 50 feet from the ground, then you start pulling in that lever to increase your lift and slow you down like a brake. So you can control the flight as it's coming down without the engine. Yes. Oh, absolutely. In fact, yeah. the aircraft is more stable because you don't have that engine trying to tear the rest of the aircraft apart. I see. All right. Yeah. Great to know. Yeah. But it's very, so, yeah, very stable. And and that's the good news. The bad news is you only got one try. Yeah. Uh -huh. And you yeah. got to have something to put it down. And uh, I was just thinking. Um, what would be the easier landing, the water or the land, if you're if you're in trouble, or it depends on you know like what would be the safer way to land? You you know you got a situation there. Yeah, uh, always always the land. Uh, you know, now a wet rice paddy is okay because the aircraft isn't gonna isn't gonna sink. You might be halfway up the 
with chin bubble and, and muddy water, but no, uh, water is a last resort. Yeah. And, and because we, uh, often went out to the hospital ship, uh, out in the South China sea, uh, that could get a little, uh, interesting, especially at night in bad weather. Uh, cause you're going out across the ocean. We have no, uh, navigation equipment to speak of. I mean, like, uh, GPS or anything like that. Uh, if we go down in the water, all we can do is get out of Mayday and hope that we can get out of the aircraft and, and float until somebody finds us. Uh, and of course, again, if you're, if it's at night, uh, you could be out there for hours. Right. So, so that was my question too. You, you've done dust offs at night and, and 40%. 40% wow. of our missions were at night. And and how were you guided to uh, where the wounded were? Oh, you're going to make me tell some secrets here. <laughs> <laughs> um, people, people that uh, have pilot's license know what an instrument landing system is. Right. And that gauge on the panel uh, is a, um, a vertical needle and a horizontal needle with a little circle in the middle. We call it the donut. And when we talk to you on the FM radio, if we put it in the homing position, uh, if you're off to my left, that needle will swing to the left. Mm -hmm. So what I do is while you're talking to me, I turn the aircraft till that needle is centered. Now I know that I'm heading right for you. Now you've given me your coordinates in the clear. You know, the bad guys know where you are. They shot you. Don't, don't give me coded stuff. Just give me the coordinates. Mm -hmm. And that's the general direction. And when I get in the air, I know about how long it's going to take me to get there. So, so I can give you an ETA when I first make contact with you. And so I might need to keep you talking until I get that needle centered. So now I'm headed right for you, but it doesn't tell me how far away you are. So mm -hmm. once I get that needle centered, I say, okay, ETA zero five mics. Give me a call when you can hear me. Wow. All right. So now I've got two questions for you. One is sure. how many passengers can you take before it's dangerous? Weight is critical on a helicopter. Right. Uh, we would go out for one of you. Didn't make any difference how many there were. Uh, one night I was called out for two South Vietnamese soldiers. Um, Fifteen jumped on board as soon as we touched down. The mm -hmm. guys in the back are yelling, go, 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 because they know if we get too many on board, we can't lift off. Right, okay. I thought that was a lot till a friend of mine told me he had 21 on one night. Same uh -huh. thing. Landed, South Vietnamese troops jumped on. All I can do is just is just go land at the South Vietnamese hospital and let the you know let the the medics sort them out. Right. Uh, but yeah, that that happened a lot. And yeah. and again, uh, yeah. well during Amazon seven one nine, our guys were greasing the skids because the the South Vietnamese were were hanging on the skids. Um, <laughs> well, a good friend of mine uh, who who has his own helicopter company in Northern California. Uh, had a couple guys hanging on the skids, and it was all he could do to just get off the ground and get some forward motion to get what we call translational lift, which gives you a little bump in your in your flying. Well, these guys uh, were uh, uh, what am I trying to say? A, a bunch of tanks, and uh, as he's trying to get some altitude, he just barely was able to skim over the top of a tank, and it knocked two of the guys off that were hanging on the skids. So mm -hmm. that that allowed him. To climb out, yeah, uh -huh. and he said it wasn't intentional, but it just so happened that that was that was all the higher he could get with them hanging on, and once oh. once they fell off, then he was able to. Well, right. again, he they were in a, they they swarmed his aircraft, and uh, he almost couldn't make it out. Uh -huh. and my, sec my, my second question was: uh, Did you have that have the episode um, that you had a let's say you, you you or somebody you know a chopper went down? And you had a call for a Chinook to come and sling you out or something like that? Get the chopper? Well, of course, the first priori priority is get the crew out. Right. Uh, and then uh, there there were recovery teams like the Chinooks. Uh, they would have the infantry and they would win. They would secure the aircraft if possible. And then there were guys that were trained to uh, properly rig the, the, the downed aircraft so the Chinook could pull it out. Uh, so yeah, there was a procedure for that for sure, uh, but but again, first priority is to get the crew out. You want to explain what a Chinook is to the people who don't know? I know because I wrote on one. You know, I know what they are. Sure, sure. Uh, twin engine, uh, dual rotor, uh, cargo helicopter, CH's cargo. 
uh, and uh, it could uh, handle, I think, 44 troops, uh, fully battle dressed with your rucks and all that other good stuff. Uh, that it could, uh, yeah, um, those the Chinooks were invaluable. Yes, uh, it, it could lift a Huey out, uh, a downed Huey. Um, but yeah, it, they uh, had quite the, the cargo capacity, and now the improved versions, of course, are still building and buying new Chinooks. Uh, the aircraft is just, uh, it's just, uh, the, it, gold. It, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's decades improved. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. a workhorse. It's a workhorse. Yeah. But the funny thing is though, the controls work exactly the same as a Huey. Yeah, yeah really. The Huey's oh. got one, one two bladed rotor. Those guys got two, three bladed rotor. It flies exactly the same. The controls work exactly the same. Did you ever fly one? No, I've never even been on one. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. I, I said, like I said the other day, I rode in one once. Yeah. You know, I, I rode in one once because I, we were out, of, we were out of a nine ambush. We used to go on a lot of nine ambushes, and I got upset. I got my stomach. We really got sick, and they wanted to, they wanted to lift me up. I said, no, I'll wait till because it was like three a.m. in the morning. Let I me said, tell oh. you, let me tell you a secret. Those Chinook guys aren't that good a pilot. Really? <laughs> no, no. But what happened was, I, I said, look, I'll wait till the morning. All right. So my lieutenant, who, who took over the platoon. Asked me how I was, and I'm fine. He said, "Well, he said, look, I want you to ride. I want you to go with the Chinook and see our gear safely to our next, our next, uh, you know, air, area." You know, I said, "Yeah, no, I didn't want. I wanted to go on patrol." But he said, "No, Peter." He said, "No, I want you to just do what I'm telling you." I said, "Okay, no problem. All right." So that's the only time I rode on a Chinook, and it was, it was, and I was the only passenger. We just had all the gear, right? And I yeah. said, well, this is, "It was, a, it was a nice ride," you know. Because I, I never, I'm used to the the, the UEs and you know the choppers, and uh, yeah, this was different, yeah. completely different. Yeah, and and you know I'm just kidding about the Chinook pilots. The top graduate in our class went to Chinook school, so <laughs> I, I I say I'm I'm just teasing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was an experience. No. Yeah, Jan, yeah. you have anything you want to ask, Phil? Well, no, my the question I wanted to ask you already asked about. I was wondering how many patients you could pack technically have that was a good question because i had that so my question is how do you try to prevent all of that from happening when you have now 20 people hanging on to your helicopters or any way to try to prevent that from happening uh yeah there's really no way to prevent it it only happened the, the 15 guys only happened one time uh usually it was you know you go in for one or two and you get five or six or seven um the South Vietnamese Army, in, in my opinion, uh, they there were a lot of good soldiers, but mostly what I saw was guys that didn't want to fight. They wanted us to do their fighting, and if they had the opportunity to get out, they did. But they had some excellent soldiers. Uh, it's just that, unfortunately, I saw the negative side of it. I have, I have to tell you, I, I agree because, like I said, we had a small crew, the recon platoon, and Whenever we were out in the jungles, they were going this way, away from the action. We were going yeah. towards it, and that—that that was my impression of the of the uh, the, the yeah. army. Yeah, army. Yeah. 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 But, yeah, but how do you, how do you calculate the weight? Like, is it like the um, weight of the helicopter, and then you figure out like how much someone weighs, or? And the gear, like, how, how are you able to figure that out if you're over the amount of weight? Uh, there, there was a four-letter formula for that. H-U-E-Y, Huey. <laughs> that puppy can do about anything you asked it to do. <laughs> and, and just by looking, you knew whether you could do it or not. And if it was questionable, you tried anyway. It's, uh, a, it's amazing. Yeah, when you're lifting up, you're torquing the drive the drive train, okay? And there's a meter on your instrument panel uh, that reads in pounds, and 50 pounds of torque was the maximum. So as long as you didn't exceed 50 pounds of torque, you were okay. So you you pick it up you to a, to a hover, and as long as that torque doesn't go over 50, you go. If it does go over 50. And they're shooting at you. You go anyway, and you report that you went over fifty pounds of torque. And and on, on an average, how how long is the ride? And like you know where you would go, 
Like, is it like uh, not gas wise, but time wise to, to do a mission on an average time scale? Sure. Uh, as dust off, our missions were normally pretty short. In fact, we only flew with half a tank of fuel. Uh, the full tank is 1,400 pounds. We would fly with seven or 800 pounds of fuel because that's three or four more, more guys we can get on if we have to. Right. There, there were times that we stacked you guys up like cordwood just to get you out of there. If we'd have had a full tank of fuel, we might not have been able to lift off. But, Let me ask, I got to ask, listen, hypothetical now. Okay. Uh, let's, let's say you go to uh, a, a, um, a, a dust off, right? And okay. you got, let's say you got 10 wounded. Okay. okay. And, the, and, the, and it's getting close to the weight lift off. Did you ever had a, or do you know of anybody who has said to look, that their crew volunteered to stay behind to get the wounded out, and then you come back for them. Yeah, that's happened. That's right. happened. And, and I've been able to document that uh, in, in those books, which I'd like to talk about for a minute. Absolutely. But let me tell you, do I have time to tell you about a two or three minute story? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. There were four of us that hung out together in our unit. We had 12 pilots and plus the CO. Our, our commanding officer was an amazing guy. He flew missions just like the rest of us. But there were four of us that hung out together, uh, two 19-year-old warrant officers, uh, one of which was our unit voting officer for two months before we realized he wasn't old enough to vote yet. Uh, then myself, a 21-year-old warrant officer, and then a 22 or 23-year-old first lieutenant, because we had, we had real live officers that were flying too. So anyway, uh, these two 19-year-old guys were Southern California surfers, and they knew they had a mass casualty situation, so they took both one out. In, in a helicopter because they knew that there were going to be more casualties they could get in one aircraft. And it's a hot LZ. So the first guy goes in and lands and they're loading the wounded and the bad guys are walking mortars in. And while the other guy is orbiting at altitude watching everything because now, you know, in case something happens to the first guy, he's, he's still up. So anyway, he's calling chalk one. He said, Hey, they're getting closer. They got you. They got your zero in. He said, I'm about ready, about ready. So he comes out. So, so Chalk One comes out. He's got a full load of wounded. Now it's the other guy's turn to come in and get the rest of the guys, the wounded, and the bad guys now have the LZ zeroed in. Right. So number two calls the RTO on the ground and says, move your wounded to the other side of the LZ, which maybe was only like 50 yards or so. So call me when you're ready. So, you know, a minute or two later, they call, okay, we're ready. So the number two guy lands where the first guy landed, lets the bad guys get their mortars in the air, and then he high hovers over to where the wounded are. They throw the wounded on while the mortars are landing behind him. Right. And before they can get the new LZ zeroed in, he, he's gone. He's out of yeah, there. Smart, smart. That's what he thought that stuff. That was just yeah. two 19 year olds that came up, up with that on their own. Right. Wow. That was smart. Yeah. 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 And that's absolute true story because I got it right from the horse's mouth. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk about your book. Well, okay. you, you, you wrote more than one book. Uh, I just finished up the 19th book documenting our helicopter rescue missions. Uh, each book has at least 20 missions in it. Uh, the one I just finished, I think, has 23. But uh, they're available on Amazon. And every book has that picture of the two dust-off helicopters on the front. The reason I say that is somebody from a foreign country, uh, I have my suspicions, is plagiarizing my books using the exact same titles, but the picture is different. Really? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, but if you, if you uh, search Helicopter Rescues Vietnam or Phil Marshall Vietnam on Amazon, uh, all 19 books will come up. Mm -hmm. And uh, every one is a true story. Uh, there's a little bit of humor in a couple of them. Uh, again, if you if if we've got time, I'll pass a little bit of that on to you. But uh, but every mission in there is true to the best of people's knowledge. Fifty years ago, uh, and there are just some absolutely incredible rescue missions uh, in each book. Just uh, well, I sent a copy to uh, a young warrant officer that flew Chinooks in Afghanistan, and his comment was, "If I hadn't flown in combat myself, I wouldn't believe half these stories." Mm -hmm. But uh, but they're all absolutely true, and you guys know what we did. You you know that uh, uh, that the, some of the some of the rescues were just amazing. Yeah, I I just received this today, Phil, in the mail. Yeah, glad you got yeah. it. Glad you got it. I I think you'll enjoy it. 
Yep. Yep. And and I and, and I'm not an author. All I've done is take other guys' stories and put them in one place. Okay. Um, the the first book I did was to uh, uh, honor the 15 men in my unit that didn't make it home to their families. And I knew we had some incredible stories, like the one I just told you about the two Warren officers. Um, and I didn't think I'd sell 19 books, let alone 19 volumes. But uh, guys would read it. Oh, wow, this is great. You got more stories. And go, well, yeah, there's thousands of them out there. Right. Uh, that first book was 10 years ago. And it's just snowballed till to 19. And it won't surprise me if I don't do number 20 because guys keep telling me their stories. Uh, I got a great. reputation. I got a reputation now that if you got a uh, a memorable rescue mission. Go, go, get in touch with Phil Marshall. He'll put it in his book. Right, right. Yeah, but it, yeah, it's just, it's just. It's, it's, sometimes I'm absolutely amazed uh, at these stories, but they're true. Yeah, that's great, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, and that's, and it's been, it's, it's been an honor putting them together, and I have made so many new friends, just like yourself. If I hadn't been doing those books, I wouldn't be on your podcast right now. Right. Yeah, I met so many people. All right. And, and that, that's the what you're doing is the same thing I started around because I wanted I wanted the soldiers, anybody with uh, combat experience to tell their stories. Yeah. You know, that's the first paragraph of my book. It's called Legacy. It's, uh, what yeah. I say is what you're about to read in this book is my story. There's yeah. many of you out there who have your own stories to tell. You know, oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's the book I, there. I, I had to do a little arm twisting for some guys because they say, well, I'm just doing my job. And I go, like, yeah, I know you were just doing your job. You did a hell of a job. Right. But one gentleman in particular, uh, two Air Force pilots, the, the door gunner just happened, the crew chief, just happened to see them blow up on, on approach to Da Nang Airport. And they both bailed out. And the long and the short of it is a, a friend of mine was in the gunship that saw them. Uh, he gave me permission to use the story. He wrote up the story of how this happened. It's one of the more incredible missions. And uh, uh, he just wrote it for his, for his children and grandchildren. And and if I hadn't found out about it and said, hey, may I use your story, uh, that incredible, amazing story would never, nobody would have ever oh, read about it. Right. Mm. Yeah. And so, so uh, that's, that, that's why I say it's been an honor because I'm telling these guys, store them and giving them uh, a, a to tell their stories right. so that other people can appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Phil, so, you know, like Pete said, you guys, both you guys are two amazing individuals. And I I always do this on the shows. I thank all the veterans like yourselves that do this to make my life a better life to live. You know, I'm I'm beyond great beyond grateful for you guys, you know. But if you if you look back at the time that you had, what story is the most memorable story that you could tell the people that out of all the books that you wrote and all the experiences that you guys had in Vietnam, what what would be the main story that each one of you guys would tell to someone that has never had that experience that you guys have had yeah um i'm gonna have to fudge on that with just a little bit um flying dust off huey helicopters in combat was the most incredible thing i have ever done uh i had the privilege of saving lives instead of taking lives i know some guys have had problems with that and justifiably so um it's just the whole the whole time of being there um, uh, like I say, uh, just uh, the privilege of flying a Huey, it's just an incredible helicopter. Uh, did everything we asked it to do and, and then some. Uh, just, just the whole experience as a whole. Um, there's nothing I could have done any time in my life that would have even come close uh, to, to flying the helicopters and, and, and uh, helping guys uh, on the ground, resupplying them, uh, you know, Bullets, uh, you know, ammo, water, uh, medevac. Uh, it was just an incredible privilege to to be able to do that, and uh, it was where I matured. Uh, I've said that was where I became a man in the front seat of that Huey. Although some would question that I became a man, but uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was just an absolute honor and privilege because again, we were there. For John and the rest of the guys on the ground, that you know, if it wasn't for them, we were just a flying club, and and we were not a flying club. 
Uh, we risked our, ourselves every day. Um, in the four and a half months that I flew in Vietnam, I, I kept a diary religiously every night. And I picked up about 100 guys a month out of the jungle. Wow. The only, only guy that I ever met was one of the guys that I picked up tonight. I was wounded, and that was only because I sought them out. Wow. Uh, found a second guy, and every year on the anniversary of that, we, we one of us calls the other one. Uh, yeah. When, yeah. No, when no. I was wounded, and, and the story's in one of the books, when I was wounded, I was on the controls. And when the bullet hit my armored seat and went into my arm and severed the ulnar nerve, ulnar nerve it, it knocked my hand up off the control and it caused me to roll the throttle off. So bang, crash, and uh, the whole cockpit is, is orange from, from the round hitting my armored seat. And now we're falling out of the sky. So I yelled to the co-pilot. I said, I'm hit, I'm hit. He got on the controls. He felt the throttle was loose. He rolled the throttle on. He put the, the collected down, which you're supposed to do in an auto rotation. And then he froze on the controls. He was going to fly us right into the ground. Ooh. So with no feeling in my hand or my arm, I just reached down where I knew the control was. And we, we uh, you know, gained altitude. And, and I got us out of there. And I gave him the controls back and said, take us to the hospital ship. And then I worked the radios and, you know, commit, continued to be Mr. Aircraft Commander, but the co-pilot was flying. The mm. point being that... Uh, that would, of course, would have been my most memorable mission, but it was the teamwork. It was, it was, uh, you fly the aircraft so you can't fly it anymore. Uh, that's what we were trained to do. And, and even, uh, because I was never able to fly in Vietnam again, I was able to save some lives. And, and those guys went on to, to get married and have children. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, Gosh, you know what? Uh, a friend of mine uh, signs his emails. I'd give back all the medals to have saved just one more life. Right. Uh, yeah, never got a medal yeah. for that night. That's cool because I get I got to meet two of the kids of of one of the guys I pulled out that wouldn't have been there, would never have existed uh, yeah. if we hadn't gone in to get them out. So yeah, so, Bill. Sorry, you, answer, but uh, yeah. that's the uh, best answer I can give you. Yeah, you you are you are a part of history. You're a part of. Uh, a group of people that have piloted one of the most revered aircraft in military history. Yeah. Not, I mean, every UE pilot. I mean, I've heard stories from other people who served that would walk up to the UE and just kiss it yeah. for, what, for how good it was, how reliable it was. The, the pilots that saved lives like you did, you're a part of history. And my thanks to you, along like what Ray said, is immeasurable for what you and what John did and people like you to, well, you know, give us the life that we have here. Thank you very much. And 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 I still get to fly those Vietnam Hueys today, as I was mentioning earlier at the museum. And I've seen guys that still kiss the nose of that Huey. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Still. Still today. Amazing. That's great. Yeah. Yep. Nikki, do you have any, do you have any questions from anybody? Can you hear me, Nick? Yeah, I got it on mute. Um, <clears throat> not questions, just a lot of comments. Comments more about what you were asking about the Chinook, the Chinook planes and stuff. Okay. Um, no so specific. we kind of answered but we, them. But we did talk the other night because we discussed that there was about, what, 3,500 of those UE helicopters that went down during Vietnam, right? No, 5,300. 50, was it 53? Yeah. I, thought it was uh, I, I think I think the the three thousand number is closer that were lost. Yeah, yeah. There there would have been well over five thousand uh, helicopters, uh, most of which were Hueys. Yeah. yeah, but I think we lost over three thousand helicopters in Vietnam. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And and again, the numbers go with the crew. Uh, and if I could add one more thing, um, we are building the only. Huey Museum in the world, uh, like I say, uh, just north of Kokomo, Indiana. Uh, it is under roof now, but we're still uh, seeking donations to finish building the building. But next weekend, not this weekend, but next weekend, Saturday and Sunday at the museum site, uh, we have what we call the gathering of, of uh, patriots and um, um, veterans. 
And we do a reenactment with our three helicopters, with our three Hueys, and then there's also a guy that flies his personal loach down from Wisconsin. Uh, we have the blues, and, and we do a reenactment both days, and we also offer membership flights. Uh, for a $125 donation to the organization, you get a flight and a Vietnam Huey. Um, so that's Saturday and Sunday, like the 13th and 14th, I think. But uh, the website is American Huey 369. That's the tail number of the first aircraft we restored. American Huey 369.com, and all the information will be there, and you can see what we've done. Uh, but we've been in, in existence for about 17 years now. Uh, and we're, we're trying to preserve the history, preserve the aircraft, uh, educate, because a lot of the kids that I talk to at our events are not getting taught anything about Vietnam. Uh, mm -hmm. And if they are, it's one or two paragraphs in the history books. So, uh, so again, my point is, if you can help support the organization, uh, and, and like I say, for 125 bucks, you get a flight and a Huey. Uh, on the web page is our list of events. Uh, most of them are Indiana and surrounding states. Phil, give us that uh, that uh, um, connection again. Yeah, Huey three six nine American American Huey three six nine dot com, and it's in the book that you have at the back. Okay. Yeah. And that's to make a donation, also, right? Yes. Uh, well, let me let me expound on that a little bit. We're about a half a million short on building the museum. Uh, a lot of people, we're, we're, we've got a bronze plaque that will go in the main entrance. Uh, a minimum donation of $1,000 to the museum gets your name in bronze on that plaque. You, and that'll be in the main entrance of the museum. Uh, of course, that's just a minimum, but uh, we have we have kids donating 20 bucks. Uh, sure. One of our events, uh, a family of the uh, ranch that we use, their kids sell lemonade to the guys that are coming in to take the flights. And they give us, they donate whatever money they take in from their lemonade sales to the museum. I mean, you know, how cool is that? Yeah, and of course, we get a flight too. Can you imagine being a 12, 10, 12 year old kid getting a flight in a Vietnam Warbird? Absolutely. Yeah. That's that's just the kind of support we get. And uh, uh, and you said that was AmericanUE369.com? Right. Correct. Correct. Okay. I'm just wanting right. to put that, it up. Uh, yeah, that, uh, you go to that website. I mean, Gary Sinise, you know who Gary Sinise is? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he did a, he did a uh, public, uh, what, what they called PDA, PBA, public right. uh, announcement uh, yes. museum, or just, uh, you know, pro bono. He just, we asked him if he would be interested in supporting the museum. Uh, he's supposed to be coming out. I don't know when, but yeah, he did a real nice uh, 30, 45 second, uh, uh, and it's on the website. Uh, for the museum. So, uh, yeah, we're yeah. getting a lot of support and we're just a little bit short uh, on finishing the museum. In Phil, fact, the company, the company no, I'm that sold, I'm sorry. No, I don't want to interrupt you. Go ahead. Oh, I just uh, the company that uh, provided the steel for the framework of the building, uh, it, was, it was several hundred thousand dollars that we gave them a deposit a year and a half ago. And they said, you can expect the price to double by the time the steel is delivered. Well, they delivered the steel and they held to the original price. Original price, good. Wow. And and they and they weren't veterans. They just wanted to support us. That's great. Uh, awesome. uh, it's just been amazing. You, been you amazing. mentioned you mentioned uh, that the uh, the blues. You you're talking about the Blue Angels, right? No, no, these are the grunts. Oh, okay. Because yeah. I'm, the, I'm, uh, I'm I'm curious. Yeah, yeah, I'm the, curious because I I've been to a lot of air shows where I've seen the Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds. Not in one of those air shows I've ever seen a Yui. I know it's not glamorous and everything, but I would love, I would love to see that and just see it take off and be honored because the people that go to those air shows are all patriots, and Did they you, love seeing, they love uh, uh, honoring our heroes, our American uh, soldiers and men and women alike. And is there any way that you uh, can connect with that and somehow get that done? Did you notice the big smile on my face? Yeah. Okay. Um, we have done some air shows, and we do that reenactment at air shows. Oh, okay. And Gris Grissom Air Force Base, now Air Reserve Base, is right across the road from our museum. Oh. Now, it's an active reserve refueling wing there. Two years ago, Grissom had an air show, and they had the Thunderbirds there. Okay. okay of course, the Air Force. Well, we... Uh, we did the we did our reenactment both Saturday and Sunday. 
and the Thunderbirds flew on Saturday, but, but the weather was was bad on Sunday, and they couldn't fly. But we did. We oh, we did you. our reenactment because low ceiling. We don't we don't need to go ten thousand feet like they do. Mm -hmm. But here here's here was the neatest thing about that weekend. Every morning, uh, both mornings, we had a safety briefing at operations at the airfield. Mm -hmm. And so I do the I do the announcing for the reenactments, and so I'm there as a safety briefing, and of course the Thunderbirds are represented there, and they had a nice breakfast spread for us because it's early in the morning, and so I go up to one of the Thunderbirds and I said, boy, I sure hope you guys get a fly again today. I says I said you know your 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 show is spectacular, and he says, are you one of the Army pilots, the, the Huey pilots? And I said, yeah, and he I'm, this is absolutely word for word. He said, you guys are badass. <laughs> now. What better compliment could we get for right. a nightmare that a Thunderbird pilot said you guys are bad? Absolutely, at? absolutely. And, uh, that, I just, uh, again, I had just the biggest grin. So, yeah, we do get to do the air shows, and, and any air shows that we do is on the events page of the website. Okay. Okay, I was just going to ask you that. How often do you do the show? Because, like, yeah. I can't come, I won't be able to get down there next week, but I, maybe me in the near future, I could take a run, meet you, and meet you, and we'll. Uh, yeah. Well, See, when you go to the events page of the website, it'll tell you whether we're giving membership flights or demonstration or, or whatever. Right, but right. Uh, we only do two or three a year. Um, so uh, um, after uh, after our gathering uh, in two weeks, there's a small town in northeast Ohio that has had us there for, uh, I'm thinking, eight years, maybe nine. And we do a reenactment. This town does not even have a stoplight. Really, it, it it was a Revolutionary War fort, and in 2012 they are I'm sorry 1812 War of 1812. So they had their 200th anniversary because it was a War of 1812 fort, and they asked it to be there. So we took one of the aircraft down, and we've been there every year since. We take all three aircraft down, all three of our Hueys, and we do a a, a abbreviated demonstration, but. It's it's just amazing. The town is our adopted town. They've adopted us. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, again, uh, when you go to the events page, it'll give you an idea. But but uh, that is called Fort Jennings, and they're the third weekend of August. And uh, again, they're in Northeast Ohio. Northeast Ohio. Okay. Don't even have a stoplight, and they have three uh -huh. every year. <laughs> so Bill, not to not to change the subject, but just out of curiosity, because of one of the comments that we received, um, how scared were you if you were flying over water with sharks? Uh, if I was in a hue, is that like the no last problem. thing on your mind? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you won't believe this, but I don't do heights well, and I don't do sharks well. <laughs> it doesn't bother me to fly the helicopter with the doors open, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah, the, it's just, the only thing I can say is that the Huey is extremely reliable. I've never had an engine failure. Uh, even with the hydraulics failure, we could still fly the aircraft. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you, you don't want to get down in the water, that's for sure. But you, you just don't let, you just don't dwell on it. You got more important things to do. Yeah, that's yeah. what I figured. <laughs> it's probably the last thing on your mind. But yeah, but yeah, I, uh, every once in a while I have somebody that's, that doesn't want to go up in the aircraft at our events because they're scared of heights. And I uh, very honestly tell them, I said, I don't, I'm scared of heights too. I don't do heights, but it does, <laughs> not, does not bother me to fly that helicopter. That's not something you want to hear from your pilot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that means I'm going to put it down on the ground safely. That's what that means. Right. Right. Yeah. Great. You know, I got to just tell great you one thing. So far. When, when I go to, a, when I go to amusement parks, right. I don't like roller coasters, and, you know, things that drop and turn. And I got, my stomach just gets upset, right? So I never went on a Ferris wheel all my life, right? So I was at, a, at one of the amusement parks, and I, I, within the last 10 years, I'd say, maybe a little longer. And I look at the Ferris wheel and say, well, I think I'd like, you know, something that won't be bad. I mean, I, I, it reminded me of coming down on it with a helicopter, you know, the way it turns and comes down. I said, shit, yeah. I, I could, I could handle that. I was in a helicopter so many times, right? So that's what I did. And I loved it because it reminded me of my experience and now I'm coming down with it from a helicopter. Right? There you go. Yeah. But I won't go on a roller coaster. <laughs> I won't either. So I, I, I'm hesitant to say this, but go ahead. I was on that, 
I was on the helicopter and I shook like a leaf. I, <laughs> I, when you say kiss the ground, I kiss the ground. I was like, Lord Jesus, thank you. You know? <laughs> so I got to be honest with you. I was scared, real scared. Well, you probably had lieutenants or captains flying the aircraft. You wouldn't be scared if there's warrant officers up front. Yeah. I, I loved I, it. Personally, I, I loved I, it. I'll tell you, I was wet, soaking wet. That's how scared I was. <laughs> well, you know? as, long as, we as long as we weren't sweating, you didn't have anything to worry about. I think I'd be more scared with, with there's no doors and you're just dangling off there and whatever right. like you. Yeah. Yeah. Pete, People will get off of our aircraft because we fly with the doors open. That's the way the guys in Vietnam did. The right. doors were open. And we have more people getting off that aircraft with huge smiles on, on their faces uh, and, and saying that's the most incredible thing I've ever done. Right. And, and we call it smiles so big you can eat a banana sideways. <laughs> I, I, no, I'm, not, I'm not comparing a balloon to a helicopter. I've, I've been on a balloon. But the helicopter, is, is, I'm telling you, you've got to have a big pair bigger than King Kong to be in that helicopter. Let me tell you something. Yeah, it's it, You know, the balloon, it'll stay at that certain height. The helicopter, especially what you did, I take my hat. I tip my hat to you. Right. Hey, right. Right. Yeah. There's, not, there's no greater feeling than being in the chopper. Like I said, I was at the door, you know, with that everything, leg hanging out, fun hanging out, and seeing a bunch of other choppers flying in sequence, and you giving up a, gut, a thumbs up to the other guy giving you a thumbs up. Yeah. It's just the greatest feeling, man. <laughs> I, I mean, that's that's why early in the show I said, did, you know, did you know, adrenal? I know my adrenal was so, but not for the good. I, yeah. I couldn't wait to get off. I mean, Jesus, I, I was well, so happy. But let, let me offer you this definition of a helicopter. A helicopter is thousands of moving parts, each one trying to tear the other to pieces. Uh, that's, that's a confident builder. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> but, but if I'll fly one eight, nine, ten hours a day some days, I got a little bit of confidence. I'll tell you what, I think flying with you, I feel safe. But, <laughs> you know, you convinced me, but I mean, what an experience it is. You know, for, for somebody that's a non vet to go on the helicopter and say, ladies and gentlemen, listen to this man, you know, don't trust anyone but this guy here, Phil. <laughs> I'm telling you. You know, make sure that you got the right pilot. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah. There's yeah. nothing like. There's nothing like. We're all in this together, man. That was just the greatest yeah. feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but seriously, uh, we figure that about ten man hours of maintenance for every hour of flight time. Wow! Uh, really? Every year we do an annual inspection, and all the panels come off, and and uh, you know it's a very very thorough inspection. Um, and, uh, and because I get to be part of that, uh, I've got all the confidence in the world that those thousands of moving pieces are doing what they're supposed to be doing. But, uh, yeah, the, uh, the so, Huey helicopter, any, any military helicopter, uh, they, they say about 10 man hours for every hour of flight, uh, maintaining it. Wow. That's so I got, I got a question, um, besides the, the military, um, how safe really are helicopters? Like people, you know, people say, oh, you know, how do you feel? Like what, what confidence could you give somebody that wants to take a helicopter ride that's afraid, like myself, you know, before? I would be more concerned about the experience of the pilot than I would the aircraft. Okay. Um, I would say any military pilot, you could have full confidence because of the training and experience and everything. Uh, some civilian pilots don't have the training that we have. Um, they don't get to fly hundreds of hours at the taxpayer's expense or thousands of hours at the taxpayer's expense. Um, I would be more concerned about the experience of the pilot uh, than I would the aircraft. Mm -hmm. That's just my opinion. 
I have yeah. to agree with that. I would agree with you too. That would be my yeah. concern. Yeah. 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 Uh, most most aircraft crashes, whether it's you know fixed wing or rotary wing, I, look, I, I shouldn't say most. Many are pilot error. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a mechanical problem that the pilot doesn't have time to sort out, uh, that it just happens too quick. Right. Uh, Look at Sully, right? Yeah. He's a military yeah, yeah. Pilot. If he wasn't yeah. a military pilot, but those, those people were dead. Could, yeah. could, could he have pulled it off if he didn't have that experience? Yeah. Right. So, so again, I would, I would, you know, you go to Hawaii and take the helicopter tour. Uh, I would be asking, how many hours does this guy have? I'm going right. to fly it Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it, uh, pizza, that's one thing I remember when when we went over there, you know, and, and, and Sully had, you know, landed the plane, you know, it was unbelievable, you know, like to see that this guy made that split second decision and saved their lives that there's no way that he would have made it to LaGuardia, no, Kennedy, no. no way, there's no, no yeah. way he would have made it. I, I couldn't believe that plane floated so long. It was yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Well, that, you know, what the good thing about it is Manhattan is a lot of folks on that water at any given time. And, and yeah. he was right in the middle of Manhattan. So they were there in a, they were there in a heartbeat. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. He had the tug, you got the tugboats going back and forth to the statue and all this kind of, you know, all this kind of stuff. Or up, well, that, up to West Point. Why, right. That's why earlier I asked that question, would you prefer to land on the land or the water, you yeah. know, because some pilots would say one thing and some pilots would say something else. Well, as, as a helicopter pilot, a helicopter doesn't float very well or very long. Hmm. How long, how long would you give it probably? Maybe a few minutes? Seconds. On Seconds. Here, here's the problem with the helicopter going down in the water. Uh, a helicopter, once you put it in the water, it's going to tip one way or the other, okay? Remember that blade up there spinning? Right. So wait till that blade strikes the water and stops. That's when you get out of a helicopter. You don't want to be the 50% that gets out of the wrong side of the aircraft while that right. blade's spinning. Right. So you, you, it'll settle one way or the other. You've got, a, you've got a seconds to get out. Uh, and and it's going to go down. It's not going to float very long. Yeah. But again, you wait till the blade strikes the water. That's when you get out. Yeah. The blade would probably bust yeah. open. The huh? blade would probably the blade would probably burst. Right. Hitting the water. Okay. Oh, it'll break. Yeah. When it hits yeah. the water, it'll break because it's still turning pretty fast. Yeah, that's right. And then flying, yeah. that's flying debris could cut you in half. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's turning 300 rounds uh, revolutions per minute. And it's got a lot of weight to it. I was just going to ask that question. What the wow? That's some power. Yeah. 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 Oh, I can't believe you know a, a Huey. Uh, maximum weight is 9,500 pounds. That's almost five tons, four and a half tons. That's just hovering there in the air with those rotor blades. It's amazing how they can get they just yeah flight amazes me I, I, yeah igor sikorsky knew what he was doing it took him a while but he finally figured it out uh, mm -hmm. yeah well how are we doing on time nick hour and 15. all right i guess that's it then huh <laughs> <laughs> this was great phil this was a great show Oh well, yeah, thank you. I I very much appreciate the uh, invitation, and uh, you know, I uh, doing doing all those books. I've learned a lot, and I've uh, been able to pass some of it off to you tonight. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, appreciate Phil, it. you want to hold up your book, Dad? You want to hold up your book? Oh, all right. Yeah, I yeah. Phil's book. Um... I got Phil's book. Yep. Yeah. Do you want? I got your book, Pizza. Phil's book okay, is I'll Helicopter Rescues I'll Vietnam. Okay. It's, on, it's on Amazon, right, Phil? Yep. Say again? It's on Amazon, your book? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Phil Marshall, Vietnam, and they'll all come up. Go, yeah, same thing with my uh, Go on Amazon, The Last Goodbye by John Pritangelo. Say my name because there's a couple books with the same name. Come right up. Do I do I put pizza in there or? <laughs> no, just, no. <laughs> John, just John Pritangelo. It'll come up. <laughs> yeah. I might get recipes instead of a book. <laughs> 
Thanks. Appreciate it. All right, everybody. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was a great show, man. Great show. It really great show. Great anybody show. Anybody listening to this, yeah. they, they learned a lot today, Phil. Thanks to you. Yeah, Absolutely. thank you. Thanks, yeah. Any, anytime. I'm sure, they, I'm, I'm sure they become a lot more, what do you call it? Um, Knowledgeable. Appreciative Knowledgeable. Appreciative of the, the, the Vietnam pilots. You know Absolutely. What I mean? yeah. Yep. And I and I think as a parting as a parting uh, uh quote uh note here, I want like I said before about the air show. If there's some way that we could help you to give more recognition to what you did, because when you you know hear about war, you always hear about the glory, all you know, the jet fighter and this that and other thing. You guys, you you are the ones that supported all that. You're the ones that were the base of the pyramid. If, if you know, you want to look at it that way. So, if there's any way that I can help you or any of us can help us, you please help, help, us, help us. Help us build the museum. Help us promote it uh, because it, even though it's a Huey museum, it's not a Vietnam museum. What says more about Vietnam than the Huey helicopter? Exactly. Right. So definitely share. Yeah. And yeah. and uh, yeah, and and I don't necessarily mean a monetary. I mean, yeah, of course that would be great, but mm -hmm. just uh, help us promote it, uh, get get the uh, information out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, I would just ask you to go to the website and take a look at what we've done and what we're doing, and and look at the museum. Uh, it's uh, like I say, right across from Grissom Air Force Base. They have their own air museum there at the Air Force Base. So uh, you know, kind of tie the two together, but. Uh, uh, we're quite proud of what we've been able to accomplish so, so far, and we're not done yet. Remember, remember everyone, that's, that's AmericanUE369.com. Correct. AmericanUE369.com. Yeah, 369 was the tail number of the first aircraft we restored. Right, great. Um, okay. Yeah. That's so and, cool. and another time, I can tell you how the organization came to be. It had absolutely no design on being a 501c3 charitable organization where you could take flights in a Vietnam Huey. Mm. No right. way. Yeah. And it just, it just happened. That's great, man. It's great. Yeah. Very great. Thanks, yeah. man. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Phil. We really Thanks appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Have a good I'll night. Be in touch, Phil. Thank, Phil. thank be in you touch. for being here. Um, thank you for your service, and I'll, we'll definitely promote that. Thank you, Nikki. Thank yeah. you. Uh, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Yeah, same here. Uh, uh, again, just uh, hope to, hope to meet you in person, and uh, hope uh, some of you can come to one of our events. I think you'll be impressed. Definitely, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm on my way. I'll do it. Huh? That? I'm on my way. <laughs> All right, great. We'll I be ready. For we'll be ready for it. Okay. Uh, hey, everybody, have a good night. night. Hey, boys Take and girls. You too. Thank you again very much.
my friend.